to the Unriveted podcast, where we dial in on technology intersections of artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and people. Our goal with this talk is to bring up topics that were near and dear uh, to our heart and talk about the modernization of process automation. With that, John, what are we going to talk about today? All right. Thanks for the intro, Martin. Always a pleasure. So today uh, we have a guest with us, Josh Tobin, uh, co-founder and CEO of Gantry, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about his business, and then we're going to pepper him with questions until he can't take it anymore. <laughs> Maybe not that much, but... That's a bad... <laughs> so, yeah, so, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Um, should I just uh, should I take it from here? Please. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit about my background. I'm a, a machine learning researcher by training. Worked at OpenAI um, for a few years in the early days, um, working on deep learning and robotics, and became really fascinated by some of the kind of engineering and operational questions around ML because at OpenAI, we were starting to figure these things out. And it turns out for a while, at least, they were harder than the research, which to me as a, you know, as a, as a, as a researcher felt like it was the, uh, the, the wrong way around. And so I wanted to learn more about the stuff that felt hard, but felt like it shouldn't be. Um, and so that led to creating a class called Full Stack Deep Learning, which was um, sort of the first class that aimed to teach people who know how to train models, how to do all the other stuff that you need to do to make models work in the real world. And um, we were actually launching the, our first LLM focused version of that class coming up here in like, yeah, I guess like less than two weeks. Um, so really excited about that. And a couple of years back, I um, sort of started jumping into this, this world of production machine learning full time. Sorry, Gantry. We are a company that's focused around like basically what do you do with a model after you train it? Um, so how do you take a, uh, you know, these models, which, you know, in my view, models are technology, they're not products, right? They're um, in many cases, these really powerful primitives, like you can go just pay a couple fractions of a cent and have access to, you know, GPT-4, like the most powerful model that's ever been trained. But even if you have access to that, that doesn't immediately solve your problems for you. So as a business, in order to solve problems with AI, you need to figure out how to take these models, which, you know, maybe you buy from OpenAI or maybe you're building them yourself in-house and adapt them into actual products. So how do we, um, how do we have them work well with end users? How do we test them? How do we evaluate them? How do we have governance processes around building these applications? How do we learn whether these things are working or they're solving problems for our end users? And how do we use the feedback that our end users are giving us, which is ultimately like the best data that we have as machine learning practitioners? How do we take that data and use that to make models better? Um, and so those are kind of the, the problems that we're solving at Gantry. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a great introduction. And John and I were talking before you came on this uh, here today, and we we felt there are so many topics we can go down the rabbit hole with you, and and you did open the the gateway of bringing up LLM, and so the whole phenomenon in the last I think three months that has been ringing off my phone, and mainly from investor types, is everything you could do in generative technology and large language models, and all the efficacy questions that come up. Could you? share some of that journey from your perspective and, you know, where maybe Gantry pops in and helps, or maybe just observational uh, information would be lovely to hear about. Yeah. About like the transition from, you know, the way ML was a couple of years ago to this, uh, this brave new world of generative AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's been really interesting, right? Because we've, we've had a, a front row seat to this in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, I was, I was at OpenAI you know, pre GPT-3 when they were kind of in the early days of working on this stuff. And so I saw it from that lens. And then, you know, coming out and working on Gantry, we have been a, been a big believer in LLMs, you know, from the beginning for that reason. Um, just saw the technological curve that they were on. But despite that, they've moved a lot faster than I personally was really expecting. And so we've, you know, we've had a chance to work with companies working, like building stuff on top of LLMs for, you know, year and a half, like since the GPT-3 API was released. And even since then, it's completely, the way that people build on top of these systems has completely transformed. To me, what's really profound about this transition is that you, like as a company, you can now build an, a machine learning powered product without ever training a machine learning model. Mm -hmm. And that is, that, you know, um, for those not in the field, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's actually really profound because, you know, for those of us who have trained models, I've personally spent a lot of time training models. I'm sure many people listening have as well. Even if you love training models, you have to admit that it's it's a pain, right? You have to get a data set. You have to clean that data set. 
You have to figure out what metric you're going to optimize. You have to optimize that metric. Um, you have to figure out if this thing is going to generalize. You have to figure out how you're going to deploy it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, MLOps has become this mess of basically, you know, engineers being asked to take on way more than one role's worth of work in order to actually solve this problem end to end of building a model, getting it into production and making sure that it works there. The profound thing about LLMs and, you know, foundation models more generally is that, yes, if you build something on top of GPT-4, it maybe it won't be perfect. Maybe it won't fully solve your problem, but you can get something pretty good without any of that effort. Mm -hmm. And it was just much, much quicker to iterate, much quicker to prototype. And in fact, like, you know, if you see all the kind of slew of announcements of companies that are building stuff with these APIs, if you go talk to these companies, in many cases, it's not ML people that are building these things at all, at least not for the initial version. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, a product team, a product and engineering team that, you know, just treats this as an API call with some prompt engineering that they have to do. And so I think like as ML people, it's tempting to look at that. And I certainly did for the first, you know, six months that I was, was seeing people do this and say like, okay, they, you know, they just haven't hit the real problem yet, right? They're going to need to build an ML team and train their own, fine tune their own models and all that stuff eventually. But now I'm not so sure. Like, I think you can get a really, really long way just with um, doing the engineering work around these API calls, if you have the right tools. Right. That's, um, you know, that brings up something that, uh, it's a good segue, I guess, into the, the question that I wanted to present you with. Um, and I think you hit on a couple of notes there that play into this pretty well. I think the first one is the fact that uh, the focus is not necessarily on the model. You know, the model has been kind of like the centerpiece of the ML space for since we started using the term. Well, we've been using the term machine learning for a lot longer than most people think. But now that it's become more prevalent in the business world, is that uh, the democratization, I think, is the right word for it of the entire ML process. And I recently read, and I'm sure you're familiar with this based on what you just said, uh, an extension, I guess, of ChatGPT, uh, which is, you know, arguably the most notable generative AI model that we have right now, or GPT-4, which is an extension of that. Now I hear GPT-5 is supposed to be coming out sometime in July. Um, so, you know, the exponential growth in that is moving up. But uh, Hugging Face, model repository Hugging Face, uh, which most practitioners have some basic knowledge of, now a white paper is come out call, calling Hugging GPT, which is designed to use chat GPTs or open AI's chat GPT interface and as a means of using natural language to connect the, you know, layman, I guess, non ML engineers or data scientists, what have you, to being able to utilize those models to solve complex problems, especially problems that might require more than a certain one type of model, right? Because models are usually trained in a specific domain. They're not really fully functioning outside of that unless you fine tune it with transfer learning. But uh, this hugging GPT, which seems to be moving more into saying the focus is not necessarily on the model anymore, but more on the ability for people that are not engineers to be able to utilize these tools without needing you know, advanced degrees or being programmers. So thinking about that, I know it's a long-winded question, uh, but, you know, what are kind of your thoughts about how a tool like that could potentially be the next uh, line of demarcation, I guess, between, you know, ML before and ML after? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, what you're pointing to here is that what's really different about these models is not just that they're powerful, but it's also that they are relatively general purpose. And so, you know, what I was pointing to is sort of one implication of that, which is that if you have a model that's relatively general purpose, then the effort needed to build a special purpose model on top of a general purpose model is much lower than building a special purpose model from scratch. But what you're talking about, I think, is like one of the other really interesting implications, which is that if you have a general purpose model, then um, it turns out that there's all kinds of things that you can build that involve basically just many, many calls to this general purpose model. So, you know, taking, going, moving from a paradigm where like the model does one thing. And so you really only would ever, you know, want to call it once per task to this paradigm where like the same model can be modified in very slight ways to do many different things. 
And so that creates this effect where people are using these models um, not just to kind of predict the next few tokens of text, but also to call other tools and to interact with other models. Um, and that's creating another type of explosion of use cases for this technology. Right, right. Go ahead, Martin. In these, it seems like there's um, a use case of the moment kind of phenomenon I'm seeing pop up and I'm being hit for, can I use it for this? Can I use it for that? And the answers are really simple. You can, but is it the best methodology or the tool or the enabler to solving problems? And in some cases, it opens up even another can of worms for reproducibility. And the concern I have is that reproducibility part when it comes to, let's say, a, a medical application where you know someone's trying to transcribe information and the phonetic of the language may be going from uh, voice to text and a blood type, something significant, which you you may have read this also on LinkedIn earlier today, like I did, where someone was giving a case or someone intended to say, you know, blood type A, but it really was blood type O or vice versa. And the implication is could be life changing if, if you get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, you know, just like the ML that came before it, these systems have tendency to fail in all kinds of spectacular and difficult to predict ways. And so a lot of the challenge of, you know, I said earlier, models are not products. One of the main reasons that's true is because models fail all the time. And that's just a truth about this technology that's always been true from, you know, linear regression onward. Um, that doesn't change with GPT-4 and ChatGPT. Now, if for some use cases, it's approaching closer and closer to always being right, but it's it's not there. And barring a change in the way the technology works, it's not going to be there. And so the question for people building applications on top of these technologies is always, how do we get confident that this thing is reliable enough to create a good product experience around? And that question is, I think, the central question in ML product development and has a lot of implications beyond just the model itself but also the guardrails that you build around it, the product experience that you build around it, and the human processes that you build around it as well. That's a, that's a good response and, and very applicable and appropriate considering <laughs> how I staged it. Uh, John, do you, do you have any anything less, I would call less, less earth shaking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to build on another, I, I mentioned in my first question that you said two things, uh, and I think I only talked about the first one in your, uh, your response to talking about models uh, not really being like the centerpiece anymore. But uh, another thing uh, is that, you know, if we're, and, and the whole point of using a ML model to create, to generate some sort of predictive output, and that output itself is input to another model to output to another, you know, that, that daisy chaining effect, that's nothing new uh, by any means. But I've, I've recently read a little more that there's this desire for, uh, you mentioned APIs, and I've, I've read more about the death of the API because computers could potentially start to communicate with one another in natural language so that, you know, if something goes wrong, you don't have to pull open this giant file with a trace back and a log and, and try to read, because, you know, error, for whatever reason, error codes in code have always been like this, you know, let's let's not just clearly state what happened. <laughs> but apparently the thought is that with this uh, potential for computers to start communicating with themselves using natural language, that there is the ability for if something goes wrong, that a human, a uh, human in the middle uh, or human in the loop or whatever, could potentially take that log and see exactly where the miscommunication happened between uh, the computers. So I guess my question is really, you know, do you, where do you see that computer, you know, communicating with other computers using uh, a means other than, you know, what we're traditionally doing, like APIs? Is that, have you seen any movement in that area? Is this like a new topic to you or what are your thoughts yeah, um, um, either way? I think there's like kind of, um, there's a few different directions to take this theme. One is there's this idea of like a 
a GPT as basically, a, you know, a new kind of general purpose computer. And if you extend that metaphor far enough, you could ask the question, okay, are we going to, at some point, are we going to be interacting with computers that are just GPTs all the way down? You know, they're just transformers that are basically encoding all of the core logic in the computer and maybe, but I think it creates a lot more problems than it solves in the near term. And so I think it's, that's more of a science project than anything else, right? Like, you know, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug of computers that they're reliable and they, you know, up to, um, up to, uh, like quantum silliness, they more or less do the same thing <laughs> every time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think, you know, if, if we want, if we were to rebuild computers without that assumption, which is not, which is what we would lose if we built them on top of machine learning models, then I think it's just, there's a, a lot of leaps that you have to make to believe that that's actually going to be useful. Mm -hmm. Another way to take this question is like, you know, in some ways, kind of the opposite, right? Like, so the, the chat GPT sort of plug-in idea is that like models, them models can learn how to interact with computers. So mm -hmm. in some ways, like uh, a different way of conceptualizing an LLM is it's like an interface on top of all of the computing infrastructure that we've built so far. Um, so anything that has an API is really a tool that a language model can use to achieve its achieve whatever aim you set out for it. Um, mm -hmm. That's a direction I'm more bullish on. And, you know, maybe a third way of looking at this is like, okay, APIs are powerful, but they're kind of limited. Like you might have an API for your website, but that API is not going to be able to answer questions about the website. Um, it's not going to be able to summarize what the author of the website thinks about a certain topic. Um, an LLM mm -hmm. can do that. So eventually are we going to have, you know, LLMs on top of all of our software in the same way that we have APIs and those LLMs that sit on top of the software will talk to each other as mm -hmm. like maybe even a higher bandwidth way of different components that we have in our software systems communicating with each other. And that's um, maybe in between the two where I could actually see that being pretty plausible, but you know, th there's the use cases of it today are less obvious. Gotcha. So we'll need to, we'll need to hold on to our computer keyboards for a little bit longer and replace, <laughs> instead of replacing them with microphones. <laughs> I mean, that I'm not so sure. Like, I guess why not just replace it with a microphone if, if that's a better input modality for you? Could be, could be. <laughs> interesting stuff. Very interesting. I, I was I was wondering if we were going to spiral into the uh, HTTP uh, response codes and, and having machines kind of fire at each other, redirects, you know, a, 30, <laughs> a 302 at each other as, as their method of communicating. I, I think we'd be in a loop. Yeah, it's easy to see it's easy to see loops coming up in that kind of thing, right? It's like, yeah, it's it's a little bit um it it feels potentially a little bit recursive, but I don't know. I mean, wouldn't you want an API that could just ask a website or wouldn't you want to be able to just type in chat GPT like, you know, what is um uh what it what does uh Martin Miller think about, you know, ice cream sandwiches and have it just give its best understanding based on your API? that you program to answer questions based on how you want it to, an to answer them. Um, of, of course I would. And it, it would be an it's it ice cream sandwich from San Francisco or South San Francisco. If you drove by the factory appropriately. That's a good choice. Yeah. Sounds like, a, sounds like our next sponsor. <laughs> Unbeknownst to them. Well, this, this may be a, a good time to do a wrap up here, John. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. You know, we could go on forever about about these topics, but uh, you know, people's time is limited, so we'll save it for another time. Well, well, Josh, uh, on behalf of the huge unriveted team, John and I, we want to thank you for for joining us today. <laughs> yeah, thanks so so much for having me. It was a fun discussion. Awesome.